I'm John Stobart, and here I am on Prospect Mountain in upstate New York, overlooking beautiful Lake George. Now, the reason I've chosen this site for a painting is it's got all the things that I love to get into a painting. A nice sky, a range of hills, water, and foreground foliage that's changing color. Now, all raw beginners and people who are starting to draw and paint for the first time have got to realize that the most crucial thing is that you've got to learn to draw. You can't, drawing is the walking, painting is the running. You can't run before you can walk. And Cezanne told us that the, the major three things that everything seen falls into, the main categories, are a cube, a sphere, and a cone. And if you look at things outside, you'll see that he's right. So what the beginner has to do is to learn to draw these things. And they've got to draw them ad infinitum until they get an instinctive ability to understand the way they're constructed. So let's see if we can just play with this a little bit. Here is a cube. Now, you can't really draw a cube without understanding basic perspective. And perspective also is th in th everything seen. You have to have a horizon line. The horizon line is where the vanishing point goes to and is always at eye level. Now here we'll draw a cube. Those lines go to the vanishing point. And this line here would go to the vanishing point. That's disappeared behind the cube. But then we'll put the side of the cube in. And then we'll shade this side. There's a cube. And then there'll be a shadow cast here, like that. There's a cube with a shadow cast. But you can draw a cube in every different way. And each time, there's a vanishing point. There's the vanishing point of that cube. You've got to learn how to draw things in every, every conceivable position. There's another way of doing it. But the vanishing point would be up here in that case. But basically, the building, you can construct a building from a cube. Like that. That's absolutely square, and it goes down to the vanishing point, which is on the horizon line there. There's one vanishing point, there's the other. And here's your cube. And you can play with this and play with this, but the rules are all the same. With this here, there's just the one vanishing point, because this is parallel perspective. This is parallel to you. This here is linear perspective. And there is the way that's constructed, right like that. Now, you've got to keep on and on and on. And, as you, and you can teach yourself to draw. You don't have to go to a college to learn to do this. You can just keep on and on and on, always remembering that, the, that there's a, a horizon line and your cube will always have its sides going to a vanishing point. All the lines go to vanishing point. This would be way over here. There's our cube again. There's the vanishing point, and the vanishing point for this side would be way off here. And then we'll just shade that, and we've got another cube. Draw a cube until you understand how to do it. It's in all, everything that you see. Now we'll go to the, the cone. The cone is a shape like that. Basically, a cedar tree is a cone. 
like that. It just has a little, a little trunk underneath it, like that. Now to draw a cone in perspective, you have to have an ellipse under it, either on top of it or under it. That's looking under the cone. There we are. There's a cone. Looks like a hat, doesn't it? If you're looking down on a cone, the ellipse is like that. You've got to learn how to do these ellipses. That's the most difficult thing for the beginner. Now, the beginner, if the beginner can handle things like cones, cubes, and spheres, of course, sphere is just round, a globe, and shade it a little bit one side, and then it'll have a little cast shadow under it like that. There's your, your sphere. And when you've learned to draw all these things, you can get to basic perspective, such as a street scene. Now here's a building on our left, which is partly a cube. We'll find the vanishing point there. There's the horizon line. And then a sidewalk. Other buildings. We'll shade this side of the building. You can put windows in. All the buildings, all these lines going this way have to go to that point, right on the horizon line. And then on this side of the street, why don't we have a, a church? A steeple. And all those lines will go to the same. There's the width of the steeple. And then we'll make the church go back down that way as well. That'll all be in shadow. And the steeple is a cone sitting right on top. And this will have little things like that. Here's the roof of the church with the windows and the doorway, steps leading up. Here's a sidewalk coming down. And there's our little street scene. Here's some more sidewalks. Then we can have a tree here, another cone. You see how that's built up? And a nice tall modern building down the street there. Basic perspective. Now sometimes this is parallel perspective. You've got to be within 60 degrees to be able to have every line parallel. If it gets more than 60 degrees from the viewpoint, it starts to come together. These start to vanish to the vanishing point again. But within 60 degrees, you're perfectly OK being all these lines will be parallel. Now, let's do one more scene, and we'll do the corner of a building, like that. And now we've got two vanishing points. There we are. There's the building, right on the corner. It's really basically a cube. These are the fundamental rules of drawing. You've got to know your perspective. Because if you're just a little out, you could blow it. It doesn't look so great. Windows in the building won't do much to that. And then all these lines go to the same point. Taller building here. There 
that out. You see how it builds up? You've got to remember that this is the rule. Two vanishing points, all these lines that are relative to that surface will vanish to that point. And all these likewise will go over here. And that is the, the, basic, the basic principle of perspective. Horizon line, which is always at your eye level, and all the lines go to the vanishing point on this particular surface or that particular surface. And in this case, all the lines go to one vanishing point here because this is parallel perspective. Now, a student or a beginner should practice doing this and just play with it and not even try and complete the thing, but just you can learn yourself by observation. If you go outside and look at a street scene, you'll see exactly this and you'll see where that vanishing point is and you'll think, yeah, that's right. Those are all going, even if there was, a, for instance, a, a row of telephone poles here, those would all be, the line of that would go. And that's it for that basic, simple drawing perspective lesson. Before I start this painting, I'd love to share with you the special way I prepare canvases. The first thing we've got to do is to stretch the canvas so that we've got something to paint on. Now the store-bought canvases, and I have one here, what I don't like about them is that the canvas is too close to the wood. Now when I press this down, you'll see that that is contacting the inner edge of the wood. And in many cases, you'll see old paintings with cracks around them in that position. I don't want that to happen to my paintings. Otherwise, this is perfectly good for anybody to paint on, perfectly good for the beginner. But the way that I want to do this is to shave down the inner edge of this stretcher piece, and also I want to round these corners off. So I'm going to go straight into this. There we are. I've got my little portable bench. And we'll take my portable plane Perfect. Now I'm going to round that edge off. Now these other two edges, very important. Make those round. Oh, that's beautiful. I love working with wood. Now that's prepared in the way that I would like to have it. Right there. Perfect. The edges are rounded and the canvas, when it's stretched, won't touch that piece of wood. Very important. Now we'll put this together. They fit in very easily. There we are. This is a 12 by 18. And the first thing to do is to get it all together so the corners are all even. Now we want to make absolutely certain that this is square in all aspects. And to do that, I'm going to just check the measurements here. That's 11 and 7 eighths. Here we have 11 and 7 eighths. Very rarely do you get this right the first time. Look at that. That's perfect. 17 and 7 eighths. Now and check the diagonals. 
Yes, that's absolutely square, just as I did it. Now we're ready to stretch the canvas on this. Now I buy canvas in 52 inch rolls and there's plenty of canvas on here for big paintings and little paintings. And I've cut a piece out that I'm all ready to stretch here. Now to be absolutely certain that this doesn't move out of square, I've got another little gadget that I'm going to put on the corner, and I'm going to nail that to the corner right there, being careful not to go through to the canvas. It mustn't come out the other side. And I've got some little nails here, just inch panel pins, inch panel pins so that I can put them on each corner. See, we've got to create a triangle here so that when we start to stretch the canvas, this doesn't move. See. Now this one has to go quite deep because it's got to go right through into the tongue and groove. Perfect. Now, we're ready to stretch the canvas. Now, I always like to use copper tacks. Here we are. Because copper lasts and doesn't rust. And I start with three on each side and then pull to the corners as work progresses. making sure that I don't want to knock them all the way in. Sometimes artists use canvas pliers, but I'm going to do this by hand because it'll show you how to do it without needing to use canvas pliers. Now I'm going to pull this very tight and put that one, making sure the, the canvas grain is parallel to the, the sides. There we are. One. Another one in there. And one in here. Copper tacks are wonderful things, but they are very, very soft. The metal is soft, and sometimes when you put the tack in, the, the end of it will bend. Pull that really tight, that one. I want to make a really good job of this so that it looks very pristine when it's done. Now, to do the rest of this, the, you have to pull towards the corner, like that. Working from the center point, pulling outwards and that way. And sometimes the, you can use canvas pliers, and I'll just put a couple of tacks in with the canvas pliers, like this. Here they are strange looking things, but they'll grab the, the canvas and pull it really tight. Like so. Grab it like that. There we are. That shows how the, the canvas plier pulls the canvas and stretches it. And I would normally use those on a larger canvas, but for this, the purposes of this, I'm just going to go on now and stretch towards the corners and continue doing so.
Now that's perfect, look at that. Wonderful. Now I have to remove the nails and the template that I put on there to keep it square. So we'll just whip these out. And then I want to show you how I do a corner because I like the corners to be nice and neat at the back. There we are, perfect. Now let's do a corner. Now there are two folds in the corner. I put it like so. Get a tack at the ready. Now there's one fold right there. Then this fold here comes over onto there. Now each corner is going to be done like that. Perfect. Now I've done all the four corners, I'm going to show you how to put the wedges in. A lot of people get this wrong. It's very simple. The wedges, and they come in all sorts of sizes and shapes, they should always be put in that way. So that when you knock that, this surface is getting the knock. If you put them in this way, that sharp edge, and you start hammering that, that would split the wood. So always remember to put the wedges or the pegs, the keys, in that way. Now one more thing that we want to compare is this store-bought canvas. Just look at the difference now between the edges here you see my nice rounded edge and the store-bought edge is very sharp. In fact, this ground will crack down that edge in years to come if it isn't already cracked. And what we need to do is have that option, which they don't have here because it's trimmed off. That's trimmed off there. So there's no space to move the canvas. But with mine, not only can I pull it over, because I've got lots of room here and here, so I can pull it any, wh any which way. And I'll just show you one that I did that to, which is this one. This is the Maui subject that I did on camera. And I wanted a little more foreground, a little less foreground, uh, I beg your pardon. I want a little less foreground, and I wanted a little more sky, because I'm very keen about skies. So you can't see where that edge was, but the edge of the canvas was there. And when we turn it round, we see that I took space off here to go down. Now, I wouldn't have been able to do that if I'd had the store-bought canvas. This is why my system works well. Now, before I add priming to this surface, I want to make sure that priming is going to stick to it. And to do that, I'm going to make a very slight sanding of this. That's better. That's knocked off the edges. Now we'll prime. And here comes my closely guarded secret, how I prime. I use a credit card. We don't want to know the people to see me use their credit card for this but this is the best implement that I can find to do this. Now the reason I use a credit card is that if I used a brush, the brush strokes would go up the hills and down the valleys. All I want is to fill the valleys as much as I can and maybe a little bit on the hills, but this is the way I do it. Now this gesso will be dry in about eight minutes, the first coat. And I put three coats on usually. The third coat will dry in about two minutes or even less. It's, it's funny, the, the more gesso you put on, the quicker it'll dry. Now we don't want any ridges here. 
So I'm slightly, the reason this is good is that I'm slightly bending it like that. Perfect. Now I'll take a little, I always just go along the edge like that to take that edge off because we don't want build up on that edge. Because as you remember, I may want to move this. So I don't want to have to scrape down great build up along the edge. Perfect. Three coats after that, and that's it. Now here we have everything that I like to take painting with me. First the seat. Some people like to stand. I like to sit because I can concentrate better if I'm sitting down. Now I have a camera tripod here and a box. And the box fits onto the camera tripod because it's got a thread underneath it. We open this and this becomes an easel. As you see when we go outside, you'll see that I'm painting with this and this becomes the easel. And it fits onto the camera tripod because it has a metal plate inside with screws at four corners and a thread, a hole in the middle for a camera tripod thread. Bob Lockheed was a, an artist and he passed away many years ago but I knew him very well and he told me about this. When he went out painting, he was the first person to finish at a demonstration. While everybody else was getting their gear out of the car, Bob was finished his painting. Very good idea. Now here's the canvas, of course, that we've just prepared. And now we'll look at what has to go into the box. Here's the selection of brushes. All sizes, some of them worn, some of them new. But basically, I like to have a nice range of brushes, big ones, to little ones. The smallest would be this one here. And very rarely would I need a sable. But I like to take a sable just in case I need it. it. Has to be there. Very important item is the palette knife. For scraping the palette off or for mixing paint, uh, a palette knife has many uses. Here's the small palette that fits in the box. And here are my five colors. Number six is titanium white, which I don't call a color. So starting from the dark here, burnt sienna, French ultramarine, permanent green, Windsor red, and cadmium yellow. Now I like to keep my palette very, very simple so that I get a continuity of feeling all throughout the painting. I don't like to go off and do emerald greens or alizarin crimsons or very acidic colors that will jump out of the spectrum. With these colors, I can get anything out there, and I don't need to have any more to do anything else for me. I like to use very, very little linseed oil because when you start to paint outside and you're painting with turpentine, the turpentine will start to evaporate and the paint will get nice and tacky so that you can work into it well. That's the big secret. So that it's not all sloppy and you can't handle it. I like it to get tacky quickly and that's why I use mainly turpentine outside. Another thing I've got here is a little file of uh, tacks, nails, and whatever else I might need. Plus a little hammer over here. My little hammer that had the screwdriver on it, I like to take that with me. And another thing here is the corks. These are very important, the corks. When I finish the painting outside, sometimes I like to put the corks in the corner, like so, and like so, and maybe one here and one here, and then have a board that will go over this 
These will be scotch taped to the canvas. And then when I put the board on top of that, of course it'll be bigger than this, nothing can touch the canvas. It protects the canvas. Even in a suitcase, I've uh, traveled with that system. It works perfectly. So the corks for me are essential. Of course, the medium holder for the palette. And last but not least, a razor blade. Sometimes when I do, when I go out twice, the paint has got dry the second time around. I've been waiting for a certain atmospheric condition to happen. And I've got some impasto there that I want to scrape down. Very important to me to have a flexible razor blade, not a hard back, double edged. Very important. So that completes this little grab bag, and everything goes into this bag here. And even if you're walking around Venice for hours, that's all you need, just one bag. And I'm very happy with the way that works. Now, the reason I chose this particular view is that I love the way the lake goes right into the distance and then through a gap and beyond. I, the, the core of the composition is right in the distance there, which will be about here. And the, this rock will make a nice left hand, a nice solid left hand bottom corner. And the tree will go up to about here. So it'll be nicely framed there. And then I'll put probably not that tree. I may change that tree because I really don't like the look of that tree. I'd like to have a one of these other trees that I see around me, I'll put that in its place right there. Now I've got to make a decision here fairly early as to what I want to be happening with the cloud shadows because the distant hill right there is at the moment in shadow. And just a little while ago, all these mountains here were in shadow. And what I'd really like is for this tree to be in light and for this mountain here to be in shadow. So that will guide the eye into the distance. So I will start off by making that arrangement. You've got to come to a point of no return. And you've got to figure out that um, that's how it's going to be. So I'll just start blocking in now and get the whole painting moving here. My purpose is to trigger your enthusiasm and make you realize that you never succeed in anything until you yourself are triggered, motivated, inspired, convinced about what you want to do. Just making brush strokes, figuring out where everything's going to be. This is all going to get a little bit darker in the darks. I just want to see how it all fits. And I'm not going to put this big tree in. I'm going to put a an orange tree in there, one that's already turned a nice orange color. Now I like the sky right now, and I've got to memor memorize it because I like the way these cl gray clouds are coming from the left, because they do that. They sort of resolve the rest of this, and that leaves open an open space here for some scattered clouds, which I can decide on myself. But I like the way those gray clouds come in from the left. I like that at the moment. But I always want to reserve the option to change my mind later on. But I'm going to put the sky in. Yes, I like the, the way the sky is creating a, a hole that looks right down into the distance. The clouds make a shape too. We're all, we're trying to get space. We're trying to paint the space between me and the distance. 
And this foreground cloud, the way it comes in, is very good, and it's doing that. But I don't like the fact that it, it's making it look rather stormy. So I won't put a dark cloud in the top here. I'd rather have these white, fluffy clouds, and I'll wait. I'm getting the, uh, roughly what the sky color is. The blue in here first. And then I'll make a decision as we go along when I'm working on other things. And then I'll come back to the sky when it's exactly what I want. Right now it's all too loose and the paint's all too loose. I like to cross hatch the colors so that I don't get any you're not painting a door, you don't do this like this. Now right now, the, almost the whole, the entire view that we're looking at is in shadow. But it does give me an opportunity to see the color in the distance of what the, the, hill, the hill color is. It's basically a very dark blue with red in it. And it's therefore, I'm using French ultramarine and Windsor red, and I'm putting a little bit of the green in it as well. But basically, it's a very dark blue. If you get it too hot, it won't recede into the distance. Very dark. Now, in a little while, when the sun comes out again, we'll hope that it'll all jump to life. But these cloud shadows can be, on the distant hills, can be used to pick them out. I'll pick out one range and then put another one in light. And you almost have to make a decision as to what you want to do, what you want the pattern to be. And I've made a decision now that I'm going to have that hill that I've just done in shadow completely all the way to the top. And then it'll disappear into the tree that I'm going to put right here. But I keep that in mind all the time. I'm going to have a tree right there. Now, as I get towards painting the sky here, it reminds me of what happened way back in the year one when I was at College of Art in Derby. Uh, in England, uh, I'd borrowed my father's brownie box camera, and this was a little tiny box. Uh, it took 127 films, I think, and it took 12 on a on a roll of eight. So each photograph was very small, about that big. And I'd gone out taking pictures of the sky, and of course I took the little photograph into the College of Art with me to paint a sky that I'd been doing, and the teacher came up to me, a fellow we very greatly admired, a fellow called Alfred Bladen. He came up to me and said, um, he said, you know, and he was chuckling, he said, he said, don't do that, he said, uh, and he knew that all the other five of us were, were listening, there were six people in the class altogether, and he said, what happens is if you copy a photograph, that the work takes on the nature of the photograph. What you've got to do is to go outside and see the real thing and work on it directly from nature. And then your sky, and watch the way it moves and watch the way things happen, the shapes of them and the space between them. And if you think about all that as you're doing it and do it from life, it'll get the character and the personality of the very sky you're looking at. It'll somehow get transferred down onto the brush. If you copy photographs, that is out of it plus the fact that your own personality, the way you paint, that's different from everybody else, that's where you lose it from copying photographs. And it's the worst thing that you can do because it dilutes your most important asset, which is the way you relate to something living and put it down on canvas and then it has life. And that's, that's the moral in that one. Now, as you probably notice I've changed the orientation of the canvas so that when the sun does come out it's not shining in the paint. This is a necessary thing plus the fact that I don't want it right on the canvas.
canvas because it's too bright. And the fact that it keeps going into shadow is really helping me somewhat. But when it does come out, I don't want to, uh, the paint glistening. Uh, I'm working now, mixing various colors of the sky in the distance so that it recedes right into the distance. Right in the very distance, it's sort of pinkish uh, and almost indiscernible. Now, these brushes that are flats, I always use the same type of brush. I never use filberts, although this has almost got a filbert shape. It's rounded at the top now. Uh, I like to keep changing the direction of the stroke and cross-hatching the stroke so that I don't get any, I want all different colors in here. I don't want just one flat color. So I don't just do this to it as you would do with a door. I try and change the, the angle of the stroke so that the, and I can feel the other paint now pulling the paint off this brush. I want a cloud right there. Some people say, well, you seem to hold the brush rather strangely. And I say, well, that's the way I get my best effect. That's my big secret, maybe. Now, that's looking good. We're going back the, this aerial perspective in here. It's the aerial perspective is the, the way the tones are start as stark nearer to you, as white as they can be. They're never white. They're way down from white. But as you go into the distance, they get grayer and grayer and grayer. And all the way into the distance there, you can really hardly tell the light from the dark of things because they'll merge right into the, the gray of the distance. And that's aerial perspective. And it's happening all the way in these trees to there, to there, to there, and all the way into the distance, exactly the same as it, as it is happening in the sky. And if you, if you understand that, and pick up on that and put it in the painting, your painting will look larger than life. Mm. I'm just establishing the shapes of those distant mountains. Now the next one I'm going to have in light. That one will be in shadow. The next one, this one's going to be in light but I'll just delineate it. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay. Now, as I freeze to death here, I'm putting in the water, and uh, we're looking quite good, but the the uh, extreme cold is uh, making things a tiny bit difficult. But we're soldiering on, like we were taught to. Got to keep soldiering on, and irrespective of the discomfort, this is what outdoor painting's about. Never get those fabulous effects. You can't get those things indoors. Impossible. Yeah, we're looking good. We're looking good. Now, that distant range of hills is almost to where I'm pretty happy with it. I'm going to put a little bit more color right along at the water's edge. I see there's some nice twinkly little, I need some orange little twinkly bits there. I love that. Right in the distance. That's where it is. Funny how the trees seem to be green in one great big tract and then I suppose it's because of the fir trees. The fir trees are green and the deciduous trees are, are the ones that are making the terrific colors here. 
There we go. That looks very good now. Now, I'm pretty happy about what I've got up to here now. The nice range of hills, the clouds, but everything in the view in front of us has changed. And it doesn't look as if we're going to get much more of a, a sunny day here. I think we really had it. So I'm going to put in the foreground now as best I can under the conditions that I have here. Starting with the tree. on the left hand side and when I put the tree in first I'm going to put the dark of the tree in silhouette and then I'll put the light over it so I'll mix a neutral dark and then we'll draw the tree in it's all a matter of drawing with the paint many artists have changed direction at some point in their careers but the differing styles can generally be attributed to the difference between the unhastened ambience of the studio and their hell-bent haste to get an impression down outside before the sun moves around and changes your on-site subject. There's a lovely texture to the tree, but you can't paint every leaf when you paint a tree. You've got to suggest it. It takes a bit of practice. It also takes a bit of nerve because you're going for broke. Because you don't want to spoil what you've done and yet you have to get on with it. Oh, that's good, that little bit there that I did. And then, of course, at this point, the rock in the foreground will come and to cover things up. Now it's very, very light against dark, the tree, isn't it? Look at that. Now if the sun would stay out like it is now, it would, be, it would get very comfortable again. But it was getting, with the cloud shadow, it was getting very, very uncomfortable here. And of course, if that does happen, the best thing to do is to, is to come back on another day when it's nice and warm and not uh, push it too hard when you really can't work that well. This is, looking, this is looking quite good now. There's a fly just landed on the painting. Sometimes the flies get stuck in the paint, and I always like that because give it that outdoor look. Again, I'm just scumbling on some color here and creating the leaves, and I'll go back in a minute and do the, the darker bits again. Scumbling is when you push the brush in among all the color and mix it all up and make sure that there are some little bits of red and little bits of green, little bits of yellow, but the basis is all the same. The mean is the color I want. In other words, I want to split that color up into more exciting little tones here, and that's what you can do if you keep lifting colors up and scumbling around like this. Now there's a lot of dry grass here in the foreground and 
this is the fun part. This is where all the painting, the painterliness of it comes in. Little shiny bits of twigs and grass and everything getting ready for the, the winter now. It's all, all the blossom, all the blooming has gone out of it and it's all dying down into a dormant state. But in so doing, it has beautiful colors in it. The artist needs to be captivated by a subject rather than simply choose something that maybe will turn out okay. Generally speaking, the subject should find you, not you find the subject. It's something that you see when you're not even looking for it. And you'll suddenly think, wow, look at that. That's the thing you should paint. It's funny when you come to a beautiful spot like this, everybody else wants to come along too because they, li they like the scene too. It's just, it is just a gorgeous place. Now painting this little picture has been a real learning experience for me. I've seen many, many changes here and learned a lot about the way sky moves around and the reflection on the water and all that sort of thing. Now I did take out the road because I didn't think it was it would make the picture nice. I don't like that row of rocks there. And I don't like that tree. I think that tree looks a little corny in that position. So I took that out and replaced it with the little red tree, the little red leaf tree. And now we're going to go back to the studio and see some other paintings that have been done outside and see one of my studio paintings that this sort of thing does so much to help. Now I want to show you this nice little painting, one of my very favorites, that when I saw it, I had to buy it. It's by Michael Karras, fellow of age 40, never went to College of Art, completely self-taught. And look what he did by teaching himself. Now this shows a tremendous amount of personality. And it's the sort of painting that makes me want to get out and paint every day of the week. Now to close our little session here, I'd like to show you a painting that I did when I was about 24, 23, a little outdoor painting in London. And this here is the Thames River with St. Paul's in the background with tugboats coming up. The idea of going out and doing this made it possible for me to do a painting like this larger one of the Thames River with St. Paul's, and I did that when I was 25 in 1955. Now here's a painting I did earlier this year in Venice. Venice is a wonderful place to paint. And this took two sessions, and it's looking down past the Doge's Palace and up the, the Grand Canal with the Salute on the left. The other little painting is looking the opposite direction, all the way down the Grand Canal with the Salute on the right. And it's because I did this study of the smaller painting that I was able to get all the buildings right. I did drawings as well. And they led to me being able to do this one of the Grand Canal by moonlight that is still wet and that I've just finished. And if I hadn't been outside and seen all these things, this wouldn't happen so well. Painting outside is a catharsis for painting back in the studio. It gives you energy and terrific lot of knowledge and, uh, and makes it all work better. I do hope this video has been an inspiration to you and that you'll be able to get out and paint. I'm John Stobart. Thank you for joining me.